the galaxy burns. The heretic falls. And the emperor protects. Welcome, Imperial citizens, to The Emperor Protects, a Horus Heresy podcast with me, Doug, and my buddy, Dan. How you doing, man? Doing great, my friend. Awesome. Well, today, uh, if you didn't know, the first four episodes of the show, we're tackling the first uh, three or four sequential books in the Horus Heresy series. Today, we're talking about false gods, which is when things go sideways, I would say, uh, in, a, in a big way. <laughs> and uh, just to kind of introduce that, where we are in the heresy, right at the cusp. Um, the events that are unfolding are going down. Horus is uh, not looking good at the moment, and um, things are about to get real, real messy, although the first actual actions of the heresy haven't technically happened yet so we're we're in real time wondering how this all happened yes um so uh i have here on my notes we'll talk about books and stuff like that that we reference since we're just doing straight up reviews false mm -hmm. gods read it yeah <laughs> or don't I, I don't know it's kind of a mixed opinion book what do you what do you think of it um i, I love graham graham mcneil is the author yep. and you know i've got an autographed copy of thousand sons i mean i'm a fanboy for graham mcneil for sure, for sure. Uh, but it also there's two things. One, I think, uh, and listeners, we're gonna you know, we're gonna give her our honest opinion. If we think there's some things that we didn't care for, we'll say that too. Um, as much as we love the books and the authors, um, I think it was a bit pretentious this book because, and I don't say that in a negative way. I say that in an informative way, and that I think it presumes you know certain things that yes. you honestly couldn't know if you didn't know the heresy already. And so it, it, to me, that's a little troubling because it, it kind of fills holes that aren't there. And the other piece of this is I just really, when I read this book, really confused about how Horace turned. I mean, there's so much contradiction in a certain part of the book um, where he kind of goes into um, a spirit world as it were. And, and you have the before the during and the after. And I always have a hard time when I read this, seeing how he comes out the way he does. Yeah. Um, so those are the two challenges for me um, in this particular book, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. For me, um, if I had to give it a bit of a sum up, like I did human history in the last episode, <laughs> of course, uh, I would probably say uh, I really enjoy the book until Horace is struck down and kind of goes mm -hmm. into that dream state. And the reason is I feel like it's almost a um, is a, a Christmas Carol with Scrooge and seeing <laughs> all the ghosts and where it's like these isolated little vignette scenes that have a very powerful lesson and the character's perception is mm -hmm. inconsistent between them. Like sometimes Scrooge knows it's all ghosts and not real. And sometimes he's like, is this, you know, things yet to come? And I feel like Horace has the same inconsistencies with his viewpoint. He goes from, I know this is real to, I know this is a lie. I shouldn't believe anything to, oh my God, he really just said that? Like, yep. And so I, I kind of struggled with that one uh, a bit, but I will say like the lead up to how they got him where he was i thought was interesting where he necessarily ended up is debatable <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely um so i mean you know just having the discussion of what does it take to bring a part primark to his knees it's it's a cool <laughs> it's a cool story after then yes yep um but let's not waste any more time let's uh let's jump into it since everyone knows our books and our our references you comprised quite a uh, a mighty review for us uh why don't you go ahead and kick it off with that okay so uh, the Great Crusade continues, you know, after the events on planet 6319, yep. uh, meeting of the Interrex. But all those things that happened, there's several members among the 16th Legion, Horus's Sons of, of Horus now, that they're just asking, they're just questioning why they're doing what they're doing. Um, there's really disturbing questions about demons, about the war, kind of about the nature of the whole conflict. Like, do we need to conquer? You know, what? What is this? And there are more and more legionnaires asking these questions. Um, or what happens when it's all over? Yeah. It, so it's interesting that it's this doubt is spreading among his legion. You know, who knows what's mm -hmm. happening on the others, but but certainly here in this really key um, organization. So, uh, and we're at the point now where the Sons of Horus, as they are now called, instead of the Luna Wolves, mm -hmm. they're in transit 
to the planet Davin uh, yep. at the behest of Erebus, everybody's favorite buddy, <laughs> uh, who is the chaplain of the word bearers. And we referenced him at the end of the last book as the individual we now know, at least mm-hmm. as readers, was the one who stole um, the anathema. So yep. that's kind of a, an introduction. And the first part is called The Betrayer. Uh, and, and the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet, which is Horus's fleet, mm-hmm. they rendezvoused with elements of the word bearers uh, under First Chaplain Erebus on the planet Davin. We're not on the moon yet, um, which was brought into compliance about 60 years before the time of this particular book. Now, I've got a couple of questions that okay. I want to bring up. So, first of all, I you know, I still can't help but think, you know, Erebus was there during that compliance. Mm-hmm. Was he introduced to chaos by the Davenite all those years ago? I think that the more you read, the more that particular hypothesis is confirmed. Because... He's been up to stuff for a long time. It's not like he is just, oh, I'm just going to steal the anathema now. Oh, of course. Um, there are so many things. And the other part of the timeline is, you know, is this after the word bearers have turned? And I believe it is. I believe that 60 years was at one point when Lorgar and his legion went, Okay, and nobody knows about it. We and we know when we read First Heretic together, mm-hmm. we'll know why nobody knows about it. But I think both Erebus converting to chaos and then him bringing down Lorgar. In fact, it's the first Primarch I believe he's turned to chaos. Yes. Both of those things have happened prior to this book. <clears throat> So what are your thoughts on that? Um, I would I would definitely agree with that. I mean, whether or not this is the place that that for you know that side of seed happened for Erebus, mm-hmm. it is without a doubt very clear that like this was an important place for them learning more esoteric knowledge about the war. Mm-hmm. Because the people who lived there were already a superstitious, religious, you know, uh, chaos centered people, mm-hmm. sort of. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so I think whether or not it happened here, I don't know. Um, It it certainly seems that the word bearers would be the best legion to go in and grab that kind of esoteric knowledge Mm -hmm. with how they do battles. And we'll cover them in a dedicated episode. So I don't I don't have a strong answer, um, but but it is interesting. I mean, it's clearly an important place to them. Yes. Uh, And the other thing early on, we're introduced to a character called Petronella Vivar. And what she essentially is is. Horace's personal biographer. That's yes. her. And so she becomes part of this story because of some events that happen. Um, so at that point, when everybody's there, a war council's convened on Davin, on the planet. And Erebus tells Horace that he's recommended coming to Davin because the governor, whose name is Temba, has turned, at least according to Erebus, he's turned against the Imperium. He's taking his forces to the moon of Davin to put down a rebellion by the Davinite tribes. That's the premise that Erebus presents to Horus. Um, And it's interesting because a couple of things. One, we're going to continue to see the legions interact with tribal societies that have a a cult slash chaos culture. Yep. Um, There's a very significant one in that book we talked about, First Heretic. And then Erebus's oratory. I mean, you've got to give the guy credit. You know, obviously he's the first chaplain and chaplains are very persuasive people among the Mm -hmm. space marines. But during this really brief time that he talks to Horace and gives this briefing, it's very inflammatory, very manipulative, just yes. classic Erebus, right? But we know it worked because in the book, I mean, the easiest way to put it is Horace is pissed off. I mean, mm-hmm. he's just angry. And so I ask myself as I'm reading, I'm going, so what happened to Mr. Noble and Thoughtful? Like, yeah. <laughs> Like it, it just this is one of these these difficult parts for me, Doug, to pick up in this book is that these sea changes just happen, boom, um, yeah. you know, and nothing really significant happened between his time with the Interrex when he had all these qualities that Lo, you know, Logan admired, and now all of a sudden it's just like kill them all. And I was like, wow. Yeah, I, I feel like I mean they kind of highlighted the fact that Erebus is very he is a good orator, mm-hmm. but they also like in when he gave a speech that really um, got Horus's blood boiling. I think part of it was he did it in front of his entire legion so that he mm-hmm. had to take it personal. You know, he 
Mm-hmm. It was very intentionally done for that reason. Sure. But also, sure. like, you know, why why did Horace act like an idiot? It's like, well, so the heresy can happen. <laughs> it kind of felt shoehorned a little right. bit. Right. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, this would be a very short book series. True. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and during this, this speech, I guess, uh, Ignace Carcasey, I think people remember him. He's the crazy uh, poet. Yep. Uh, he was at the briefing and he reports back to Loken that – uh, Erebus was being very manipulative and this fits with Logan's worldview at, at this point where he suspects that Erebus, you know, Erebus may have had a, an ulterior motive for getting Horus here and then subsequently to the moon. There's some reason that this is happening yes. um, by I, design. Can I interject something here? Yeah. So I like the fact that in the Horus heresy, before things go down, the space Marines struggle to conceive of betrayal amongst each other and so they're they're looking at all these things and they're like well all roads lead to Erebus doing this but like but why like they can't they can't make that gap <laughs> of oh. understanding why he would be doing this to them uh, or spe- specifically to Horus because there's no gain from it it's mm-hmm. not even I don't know it was just I thought that was a cool like we're kind of following along the mystery with them for a little bit yes. agreed that, that's a good point that is a very good point um and and again during this conversation uh that Carcasey's having with Loken, he also mentions, and this is pretty, it kind of gets slipped in there, but it's really important, in that he saw Abaddon and Erebus exchanging a lodge medallion. Yes. And oh my God, Abaddon just goes nuts. Like he is ready to just rip the limbs off of Carcasey. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it, but it's like, ooh, I got caught. I got to get mad now. (laughs) And Loken kind of pushes him out of the way and says, get the heck out of here. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but man, Abaddon just snaps, uh, which that (laughs) there's no question now that there's something up with the medallions. medallions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Let me just confirm all your suspicions. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I could have kind of kept it on the, on the low key there and talk to you later about it, but no, I'm just going to threaten this guy with death. (laughs) Oh man. Um, So after that little, kind of confrontation, which I still think is significant because oh, especially yeah. with the, the medallion piece, um, the story shifts and there's an assault on the moon of Davin. Uh, it's led by five companies of the sons of Horus, including all four of the members of the Morn of All. Mm-hmm. And in addition, there's the 19th company, which we're going to talk about one of the, the captain who is in charge of the 19th. Um, and there's some word bearers. There are units of the Imperial Army. There are Titans of Legio Mortis, yep. who in this story are very prominent over in the hor- in the heresy. They're very prominent for, I guess, depending on which side you're on, the, the wrong reasons. Uh, <laughs> but right now they're just a Legio uh, of Titans. Uh, and as they become, cl- you know, as they get closer to the moon, now this is going to sound familiar to you readers, they detect transmissions. <laughs> Oh, mysterious transmissions. But these are talking of the power of Nergleth. And if you don't know anything, if this is new, all new to you, that word will very soon become familiar. You'll know yes. what Nergleth is. If you are familiar, we know exactly who that's talking about. It's one of the chaos gods. And this is exactly the kind of thing that happened at the Whisperheads. Remember, we had those transmissions of you know, hey, Samus is here, blah, blah, blah. And you're getting the same kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So you just know that there's got to be some warp demon chaos stuff happening somewhere. Uh, And when they disembark on the moon, topographically, there's supposed to be like a verdant forest around. Well, yes, they basically walk into this putrid swamp and you could just kind of picture Loken looking at Torgadon and going something is really wrong here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, this is this is honestly the best part of the book. It had me on my edge of my seat. I was like, oh yeah, this is awesome. Oh gosh, and especially if you know what it is, or even if you do know what it is, is what I'm saying, that it's still, yeah, you, boy, you just know this is not going to be good for anyone. Uh, so now it shifts to the moon, right? We shift mm-hmm. to the moon, and what do you want to talk about here? Uh, yeah, so as they're, as they're landing on to figure out where this traitor is like whoever planetary governor decided to rebuke you know or uh resign from the imperium (laughs) essentially yeah um they get a 
they get yeah those strange, strange transmissions and um their whole time Loken is like hey Horus this seems very like um contrived we shouldn't go like you shouldn't be here <laughs> like it just seems like there's a lot of Rube Goldberg machine reasons for you to end uh, up on this planet yes um and essentially uh Horus splits them up into several groups and they find a ship okay it's called what is it the Emperor's Pride, I think it was. The Glory of Terra. Glory, Glory of Terra. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, yep. But uh, they split up into different teams trying to figure out. They assume wherever the source of the transmission is, there also will be the traitors. And the guys on the uh, inside are having their own little debacle because the ship is like totally overgrown with nastiness. And then on the outside, they yep. start getting attacked by what we would know as plague bearers, but they have no concept of this yet. They don't understand. Um, so they described them as like cyclopean zombies just kind of mulling towards them. Turns out like the swamp that used to be a forest is full of bodies and like they start rising up. <laughs> um, it was it was really gnarly awesome. Ugh. And there's just a lot of fight scenes. So Loken was left outside and to as part of that action he's sort of defending the rear and so everyone's like man what'd you do to piss off horus man why are you in the back of the line like you're part of the mortival you should be in there yep. crushing faces and ends up he has like a super important job because all the enemies swarm in from behind <laughs> so yep. um that was the big one to me is just getting him into the ship i, I did like the the confines of the fighting in the ship because because mm -hmm. things were kind of all over the place it was a cool action scene um yeah that's, do you want me to go into when they meet up with what's his butts? <laughs> well, you know, there were a couple of things too. Is, yeah, is yeah. they landed um, the Petronella Vivar, the the biographer, just like all the other remembrancers who come along, she just can't, you know, stay out of business. She just got to, she get, just got to know. Mm -hmm. And so she ignores Horace's orders and heads down to the planet. And her shuttle is detected by one of the Titans called Days of Wrath. And her shuttle is shot down because they can detect the ship, but they can't really see it. They can't visually verify the identity of it because of the thick fog over the swamp over the swamp how convenient right and so now you know you've got this burning wreck and <laughs> the zombies are attracted to it like you know fire you know mosquitoes or whatever to a, a light and she and her bodyguard end up being saved by the astartes um which is kind of part of that rear guard action you're talking about when uh and, and this is the other thing you talked about where you know horace kind of split up his forces so he decides to take Abaddon and Axamon and another guy named Captain Moy yep. inside with him. But he leaves Loken and Torgadon. Like, how did that happen? Like, that just makes no sense to me in that he, you know, he, these are the two people that he knows he can trust the most is Loken and Torgadon. But he, they're the ones he leaves behind. There's absolutely no sense, at least for me as a reader, why he would leave them behind. And that was just weird to me. Yeah, I would agree. I thought that was weak because like I, I feel like up until the books now, Horace has always been very receptive to critique. It's why he has the mourn of all. Mm -hmm. And then the minute I mean, Loken didn't even tell him we shouldn't go fight or shouldn't go reclaim the planet. He just said, maybe don't be in front. And he gets shamed. You know, it just it seemed like yeah. too egregious of a, uh, a dishonor for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. I didn't that didn't quite jive with me. But yeah. So uh, t to pick up where you left off, where they were in the ship and uh, uh, the ship, as you said, kind of got it was moving. It was kind of settling, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it separated Horus from his kind of command um, squad or whatever. And this one, this is one of the things that to me is kind of funny is that this is a storytelling mechanic that you see a lot during the heresy where, you know, a teleportation goes wrong or something else goes wrong. So this really critical character is just kind of left out on their own. <laughs> and, and you just have to go, Oh, that was damn convenient. Yep. <laughs> Yep. He's like, okay, but hey, I'm going with it. I'm not saying it's bad. It just, it was funny how it happened. No, absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> oh my God. So talk to us about what he finds when he gets where he gets. Yeah. So he ends up finding the betrayer, this uh, planetary governor. And the two of them have a conversation. Horace is like, yeah. what happened? Like, I super liked you. Like, you were a good friend and all these things. And the guy starts explaining that, he basically starts explaining chaos, um, and from that perspective, uh, specifically, the Davenites have tapped into the power of Nurgle, it seems, or at least Nurgle has staked his claim for the mm -hmm. most part. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the two of them have this back and forth dialogue of, you know, what is the meaning of power? What is the warp? And it's not super detailed. Like it's not an exposition thing. It's just their point of views. And Horus, you know, is, is on the level and is like, you are a traitor and you will have to die. So they get into a big fight. Uh, it's a really cool fight scene. I thought, uh, mm-hmm. the fact that there is a being that can stand toe to toe with a Primarch is oh. like a surprise to Horus, and he was not ready for that surprise. Do you think he was ready for the fact how bloated and how like warped he was? Do you think that was a shock to him, like a huge shock? Yeah, I mean, they mentioned that he was like kind of aghast, at, like, oh, he's like rotting and putrescent and all these gross things. But like, <laughs> uh, what I like that they pointed out is in that fight, the favorite things that I love when they talk about Nurgle, whether it's Age of Sigmar or 40K, whatever whatever yes. is this idea of he shouldn't move that fast like uh-huh. you are so impo- it's not just that you're big it's that you're big but you move like you're a nimble little light guy <laughs> mm-hmm. to the point where it's like people can't wrap their head around this discrepancy of size and speed <laughs> um so i always love when books point that out that a lot you see that a lot with great unclean ones now and, if they're fighting what is what is temba armed with what is he carrying well we get this in two parts. One, we get a story of Loken finding a weird carrying case. You know, he pulls it up. He's like, what's this? It's a battle foam case, you know, or whatever the heck. And <laughs> right. What's inside? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and so, and then the camera's, uh, the viewpoint, I should say, switches over to Horus. And he is rocking the Anathems, the demonic weapon that Erebus stole from, what's the name of the civilization? Guys, the you, Interax. Interax. I always want to say the Mega Arachnids, but that's, no. <laughs> Same book, different story. But uh, yeah, so he has basically a demon weapon with chaos, power, infused strength and speed. And so he goes toe to toe with Horus for quite a while and he nicks him in the shoulder, which should not be a lethal wound in any way whatsoever. Um, after this, uh, what is it? Looper call himself takes out the, the demon lord, slices him down. And, and they have a, a conversation. Um, basically, he rips off the, the traitor's arm. As the guy is dying, him and Horus actually have a conversation. And um, basically, he repents. And he, he Horus like, very genuinely accepts his confession. Uh, and he's, he's confused by it, too, though. He's like, how did... First of all, how did you get this weapon? How did you end up like this? Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. the heck is going on in this planet? Like, there's so many questions, yeah. but all of that doesn't matter in the face of, like, he lost a friend. So he's just sitting there mourning oh. um, mm-hmm. and also bleeding and dying slowly. But he doesn't know that. <laughs> yeah, and you bring up a good point. It, it's such an obvious question, but it has to be asked. And it's, how the heck did Temba get his hands on that thing? Mm-hmm. Like, that is just so, oh, my God. Like, the chances of him just, he didn't just stumble upon it. Obviously there was the carrying case, you know, the whole thing. So obviously, very obviously somebody to, you know, to Loken's credit, he had, you know, thought about some things that were going on with Erebus. It's obvious now as you're reading that this was all set up. There's just no question because nobody else had the anathema at that point. No one else had it. So, it had to have been Erebus. Yeah, um, yeah the, someone on the 63rd expedition brought it. Erebus uh, was probably the most likely suspect. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like I said, Loken is, he has these individual clues of weird things about Erebus, but one, he can never find them. <laughs> like, half the book is like, while wow, he was looking for Erebus. And Erebus is just like off screen. I don't know what he's doing the whole book, but... yeah. Um, yeah, so like there's there's no concrete evidence to accuse him, but also ev- all these terrible things are happening and all these signs are being pointed towards him and they still can't figure out that he's a traitor. Like it doesn't it doesn't dawn on him still. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one of the things he does, right, is um, as he's tending to Temba, yep. um, he cuts off the transmissions and all of a sudden the zombies just collapse yep. everywhere. So Loken and Torgon, you can just imagine them being like, you know, the the forlorn hope they're at, at the door holding everybody back. They just <laughs> in front of them, just thousands of them or hundreds, whatever. Uh, and to your point also, when they find Horus, he's absolutely in despair yep. at the loss of Temba and what has happened. Um, and then they take him outside the ship and he collapses. Yeah. Yes. Um... Which... <laughs> imagine being a son you know a sons of horus and seeing your primarch just fall over oh yeah 
Yeah, I, I thought that was an interesting scene because it's the first time I had heard of um, trying to protect the image of the Primarchs above the mm. Primarchs themselves. Like, Horus is just like a sad sack of crying right now because he just lost a friend. He's just mm-hmm. sitting there mourning the loss. Mm-hmm. And they're like, we can't let people see him like this. There's been no physical... Um, ailments yet i mean he's beat up he has a cut on his shoulder but that's about it but like they don't want people to see him in grieving which i'm like oh right that's right i mean it's a minor deception but dang (laughs) um and yeah they bring him out and whatever happened to his shoulder gets the best of him and he takes a fall yep and then so they get him back to the ship to the fleet and to your point i mean these space marines are absolutely enraged they're terrified And they're Mm -hmm. desperate because they just can't understand what's happening. And the next scene is, I think, really meaningful because they get off on the hangar deck and the Mournival is, you know, around him. They're trying to get him to the apothecary as fast as they can. And, of course, all the crew and everybody else, so the remembrancers, they've kind of heard what happened. They want to be there to see their Primarch. Um, And these Marines just tear into the crowd they injure a bunch of them they kill some of them it's just absolute uh just mayhem uh and people are dying and being hurt Mm -hmm. and you know the and some of the witnesses are some of the key members like keeler Olaton, Carcasey, all of them yep. see what has happened. Yes. Yeah, the the scene of that unraveling I thought was really, really good. Because, like, uh, what is it? The poet. He, he um, is, yep. the second they get off the ship, he is from an observation deck. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. And he just sees the Astartes. <laughs> I mean, it would be the equivalent of, like, if a president of any country got shot. And then to get him to the hospital, the limo drove through 40 people. Like, mm-hmm. literally into a crowd. Oh, yeah. And, and that's how they were rushing him to the apothecary. And, like, mm-hmm. I think uh, the book said 20-some-odd people died. Oh, um, man. And it's like, uh, well, heads are going to roll for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, it, there's a really important thing that it happens as they're moving off with him is we see our young friend Efridi Keeler in a small group of we're going to pursue we're going to assume followers at this point. Yeah, they're handing out little pa- pamphlets that have the words Lecticio Divinitatis on them. And mm-hmm. this is really, really central to the story. Yep. Uh, it's it's basically, um, uh, the, if you read it, it's the exact opposite of the imperial truth that's espoused by yes. the emperor. Yep. It's Absolutely. saying that the emperor needs to be worshipped. We're not going to talk about its origins yet because that would give us some spoilers and some other stories, but... Its origins are important and significant. Um, to me, I thought it was really interesting as the story moves along how it it, in par- it kind of parallels in a lot of ways to me the spread of Christianity where you had these small individual groups of people who mm-hmm. became – you know, very, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of when you become very powerfully a believer? Um, oh, you know, very zealous. And yeah, intense. zealots. And then those small groups, you know, spread the word through this little book, you know, this little word that they had. And those groups spread and those groups. And it was just just exponential uh, spread of this thing. And it was yep. kind of interesting. Um, and it, it also, to me, you've mentioned it before, but I think it speaks to that human need to worship something larger mm-hmm. than yourself. Yep. Yeah. And that's something that they sort, uh, they cite rather, uh, quite a few times in this book is this idea of like, people just seem to make gods. Even later on when another character <laughs> is talking to a Frady, like, he's like, yeah, this just there's just patterns. Why? Like, it's just, it's always the same. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought that was really, really quite interesting. I also thought it was notable that, like, the turning of Horus in, you know, in the depths of chaos stuff, spoiler mm-hmm. alert, <laughs> for a 15-year-old book. Uh, Horus is evil, guys. Sorry. Um, this The turning of Horus coincides with the divinity of the emperor. Like, mm. it's almost like, uh, to balance the scales, yes. we created a devil and a god at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if how that, that's how it looks in the warp or whatever, but well, it's how it ended up. 
<laughs> isn't it what they always say? You can't have darkness without light and, yep. and the opposite. You can't have light without darkness. And uh, it's like that. Yeah. You have to have those polar opposites. And so I just, I thought it was an interest because they could have added that in any book, but it, it's in this one for a reason. So. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, th- I it just found that interesting. And again, Leticio mm-hmm. Divinitatis, you will hear a thousand times. We'll, we'll say that again. Yep. Um, so they get him to the apothecary. They're able to stabilize him. Mm-hmm. But the nature of the anathema being a chaos thing that it is, um, the wound will not heal, and he is dying very slowly. Yes. Uh, and and here's the thing that was really weird to me. Like, Gulliman, you know, later on in all the stories, and some other people, when they got really seriously injured, they put him in a cryotube and just, like, preserved <laughs> yeah. Like, where are the cryotubes, man? I don't get it. You know, it was just funny that... They didn't have something like that in the 30th millennium. It was yeah. just like, oh, come on. Just throw them in there for a while. Uh, nice. just, <laughs> yeah, it's just weird. It's very strange. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the s- situation with Horus. And then Logan and Torgadon, they feel compelled that they need to get back to the glory of Terra and look for the weapon that wounded yes. Horus. They need to do that. And they're joined by a guy named Tybalt Mar who is another captain of the Sons of Horus. And he goes back because he wants to see where Captain Moy had died. And so there's a little bit of something I think would be interesting to talk about here because the, it goes to different parts of the story. So Tybalt Mar was the captain of the 18th company. Mm-hmm. His nickname was the Either. And uh, Varolam Moy, the yep. captain of the 19th company, his nickname was the Or. So we have Either Or. Right. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing going on. Um, They were very close. These two guys, they fought in numerous battles side by side for, you know, years, hundreds of years, probably. Yep. So they were as close as two. you know, there was close to two brothers who were never apart. And the only exceptions that we're aware of that they didn't fight together were the assault on murder and on the Davin moon. So Mar is absolutely devastated by this, which is why he wants to go see where Moy had died. Um, and I mean, just psychologically, he's a wreck. Um, yeah. And it's interesting that Mar, just like um, Logan and Torganon later were holdouts from the lodges. Uh, but later on, Horace convinces him to join the lodge, which is kind of interesting. And he's also an important character that later um, in the books, he confronts a key loyalist leader and kills him. And he also fought in the Siege of Terror. Uh, and as you read those books much later, probably, um, you're going to see him again. Uh, mm-hmm. So it, I think it was worthwhile to call out who he is. He's not just a guy. Um, he's, you know, more than just a name in the heresy. So absolutely. Anyway. And I, I kind of see his trajectory as a good reminder that like not every Marine who joined chaos did it for like twirling mustache, evil reasons. Like mm-hmm. he was just, he was mm-hmm. taken at a moment of grief. Like so many people are, um, mm-hmm. he, you know, he, he lost somebody he, he cared for deeply and that's just a moment of weakness. And yeah, Chaos gods take every one of those they can get. <laughs> sure. yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, so, yes, good call out on, on Tybalt for sure. Uh, um, go ahead. So, Loken and Targadon go back to the command deck on the uh, Glory of Terra. They find the Anathema. Mm-hmm. And Loken realizes it's the same weapon that was stolen from the Interrex Museum mm-hmm. on Zenobia. Um, and so, this is, this is the moment of epiphany. For Logan, he absolutely beyond a doubt knows who stole it and what the situation is and why Horace is in the condition he's in. I mean, he just it's so clear to him, absolutely yep. clear. Yep. Um, and the thing is, while Logan and Torgadon went back to the moon to get the weapon, Erebus, of course, letting no, you know, no whatever go to waste is like, hey, I'm going to call together the whole Legion, the whole Warrior Lodge, all the Lodge. This is Lodge thing now. This is a, yeah. you know, quote, secret thing. And, of course, he convinces. He always does that. He wants them to be, he wants them to allow Horus to be taken to the Temple of the Serpent Lodge. I <laughs> love it. On Davin. Yep. So he's he's convinced most of the Marines in the Lodge that they may be able to use, you know, their occultist 
rituals to save the Primarch's life. And honestly, Doug, who, what Marine wouldn't agree with that? You know, it's going to save their Primarch's life. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a full range of people who believe it will work to people who are like, well, I mean, the apothecary said he's going to die anyway, so you might as well. Um, Right. There's a whole range of, of reactions. And of course, there's some that it's like, even if it does work, if we fix him with means that we've spent, you know, countless generations hunting and persecuting, what is that? It opens a whole new can of worms. <laughs> yes. yes. But we can punt that problem forward a little bit. And I think that's kind of their idea. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and then obviously Loken and Target on there, they're going back to the flagship and they basically learn the entire Legion is headed for Davin now. Yes, uh, especially the temple of the of the Serpent Lodge. Um, and when they arrive, there's this huge encampment with just thousands of Marines camping around the temple. Um, and the only two people that have gone in the temple that we can tell from the reading are Horus and Erebus. Yep. Conveniently, the doors only open from the inside. Oh, okay. Um, and of course, they find Abaddon and Axamon. And there's this, I don't know if you can call it a conversation, but... Target on and Logan have a conversation with them, and it's pretty clear at this point that the Mournival is is pretty much done yep. with those Marines. Um, and you know they argue about as a lot of the other Marines did before this happened that you know they're trusting their Primarch's fate to a lodge, which they have a lot of doubts about. So that's kind of the end of that part of it. So yep. um, last little uh, bits on that scene, though, is like a lot of the we as the audience are learning what's happening, but with various characters. So like if Freddy Keeler at the same time is seeing a whole bunch of the snake imagery and <sighs> recording that back to a guy named uh, Cinderman, the old, uh, you know, atheist preacher we were talking about in the last episode, you know, where it's like they're piecing things together, but they're all doing it individually without <laughs> a full picture. It's kind of like, yes. What is that old thing of like when four blind people all feel an elephant, they all feel something different. Like they can't, they can't put it together. <laughs> right. Where, you know, the humans may be able to understand treachery and betrayal on the level that Erebus is doing, but the space Marines can't, but they don't have the clues to share with one another to actually put the story together. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and I just thought that was a really well done thing. Yeah. And that's a good point about, um, and, and I have a question for you. Do you think that, because we know Keeler yep. has already started her journey towards becoming uh, Ember Bother, you know, she's, she's <laughs> going to, and do you think that Cinderman now at this point has started his journey to become, you know, a, a Lecticio devotee and a Keeler devotee? Yes. Um, I think it seems as though he was rattled ever since the first book when mm-hmm. he w- was on, when he saw what he encountered to be demonic. Like it, it just shook him to his core. He's been researching like mad. And the more things that are happening that have spiritual connections, like all the snake imagery of the lodge and also the planet and and stuff like that i think he's kind of slowly putting it together that like maybe there is more going on maybe i've been wrong mm-hmm. all that so he's he's been brooding for quite a while okay on all of that yeah i just wanted your your opinion about that because it's kind of hard to tell but it's certainly implied um that that yeah. journey has begun um Okay, so at this point, uh, I think I made some notes here for us that the story, and you mentioned it already earlier on, the this part of the story is can be very confusing. There's so much yeah, symbolism. Dude. There's so much falsehood. <laughs> you better take uh, a bong oh rip. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, and there's so much context that's missing. That's yep. the really hard part for me. Um it's just there are these things that are happening and you're like, okay, what does that mean? Does it, you know, and so it gets really, really difficult to understand what's happening in terms of story forward, you know. Yeah. Um, and as we said earlier, there are details that need prior knowledge. You need to know about yes. some of the things that are going on here or you can just assume that they're just happening and you can kind of bleep over the names and things like that um, as you're kind of walking through this. So do you want to start us um, at the at the beginning of the ritual at least? Uh, you mean as far as like when let's see. So when the ritual itself takes place within the Serpent Lodge building that's like all sealed up mm-hmm. um erebus is essentially sent into horus's mind uh, for lack of a better term uh, he's in a coma essentially like his mm. spirit is somewhat detached from his body and so now horus is in the warp but he does not know it he thinks he's dead mm-hmm. um 
So he starts seeing familiar faces and people he knows and slowly piecing together. And it's a little bit hard to describe because... The story is very inconsistent at this point. Sometimes he catches flashes that something's not right or he sees like a demonic face in his friend's face. Like it'll flash just for a minute. But he never like reacts to any of that, which is odd. <laughs> um, okay. Essentially, part of the ritual uh, unknown to Erebus is his sacrificial death because nothing is free for chaos. You have to <laughs> die. Like he he is the sacrificial lamb in this instant. Um and we move over and to the spirit realm, and he's been talking with his buddy uh, Sejanus. So Sejanus is the old soldier friend that he had that he lost earlier. So Horace, Horace has been talking to Sejanus. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'm um, sorry, uh, but it is it's the mask of Sejanus. You know what I mean? Like it's not really him. It's just a thing that looks like him. Okay. Um, Sejanus claims to be a. Uh, emissary of the powers he keeps saying they 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 <laughs> meaning the chaos gods yeah that and he kind of reframes the argument to like well the emperor used them to make you and then he just didn't want to continue the deal once he got what he wanted he tried to renege on on the chaos gods and so they're the victims the emperor's the bad guy uh, he did all this so that in the end he could assert his godhood and rule over a conquered mankind <laughs> <laughs> that that was their sales pitch to Horace. And to to get him to believe that, we go on a whimsical journey of um, <laughs> different settings and situations because they kind of flashbang through a lot of these very quickly. <laughs> and in one minute, he's like on a golden prairie of Terra. The next, he's like suit and clogged with filth. The next one, he's, you know, it's like screw He's going on a tour. He goes on yeah. a tour of a science lab, which is kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he ends up in the, uh, the well, not the Golden Throne yet, but ends up back on Terra looking at his own eyeballs like in a, a floating tube as the Emperor is like building mm. them, the mm. Primarchs that is. And, you know, how much of it is vision, how much of it is just what they wanted to show him, we have no idea. You can't take any of these things as fact. Uh, but this event is so momentous because it's what basically pits Horus against the Emperor and frames everything the Emperor is doing is bad and selfish and uh, keeping mankind bound up, whereas mm -hmm. Horus is now beginning to perceive himself as a liberator, that even though I was made by a bargain with the devil, we can we can come out of this, you know, stronger because the Emperor won't be here. Yeah, I... And, and this, it's just interesting because there's this, to me, there's this implication in Horace's conversation that he's aware that none of this is real. He knows that none of this yeah. is real. And he knows he's being manipulated, you know? And yet when at some point during this journey, his brother Magnus, you know, the prime art of, mm -hmm. prime art of the 15th Legion, which is the Thousand Sons, he shows up. Yep. Um, and he's the leader of this pack of wolves that he had kind of imagined earlier. And Magnus kind of pull rips the mask off of Sejanus and it's Erebus. Yep. And you're going, whoa. And, and the, he warns Horus. He says, Erebus is manipulating you to rebel against the emperor. This is his brother, a Primarch who he knows is there because he knows how powerful Magnus is as a psyker. Yep. And yet the book even says that Horace is fully aware of all the false nature of all these visions. And yet he's distrustful of his brother Magnus. And you go yeah. with what? And then yeah. here's one of those things that you don't know about. He says, you know, Horace is saying that he feels um, distrustful of Magnus because he says he's defying something called the edict of Nikea. Well, yep. nobody who's reading this book for the first time is going to know what the heck that is. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, honestly, they're not going to know what that is, other than it's implied that it was something the emperor told people that they couldn't use their psychic powers. That's kind of what the implication is here. Yeah. And so this is the part of the book that just blows up my head because there is just this abrupt transition of Horus, all these things he knows are false. He mm -hmm. says their fault. He says he doesn't believe them. And now all of a sudden he's willful. He's proud. He's resentful of the emperor. He's power hungry. Like what the hell? I, I just, it's so difficult to get through this 
part of the story and get out the other side. You know, it's like yeah. this, to me, it's like this tunnel. The light isn't getting bigger as you're getting closer to the end. The, the light's getting smaller <laughs> and you're going, oh no, I'm not going to make it. I mean, it was just crazy. And, and then he comes out. He's fully healed. You know, he, he exits the temple and thousands of Marines are like, oh, yeah, Horace. <laughs> and inside, he's like this horrible, warp-possessed thing that is just bent, hell-bent on destroying his father and his brothers. You know, yeah. and, and he's just this, uh, it's just so disturbing and so, uh, I don't know. It's just so tough. How about your thoughts on that special part of the book? I I struggle with it again. Like you, we, we talked about a few times now. Like the the jackknifing that he does between or switchbacks. I mean, rather the uh, of him between being strong, confident, and perceptive enough to know what's going on, and mm-hmm. then just a slave to what's happening to him and what's being said to him. Mm-hmm. It, it is like sentence by sentence, it changes. So it makes it a really tough read <laughs> if you. Mm-hmm want a consistent story i also feel like there was an element and i wonder how much of of this is just on a practical end for the black library writers i w- sure. I, I almost get the sense that some editor was like you should throw in a bunch of references to other things so that people know that we're going to talk about them because it's everything i mean it is there's a deluge of references that you're like this is this is only even halfway relevant i don't know what you're talking about like <laughs> <laughs> um, you know so or i don't know if it was intended to like throw it in there in this dream sequence so that people will know we're going to talk about it later and it's just <laughs> okay noted duly noted <laughs> yeah i mean we don't see magnus for like another 10 books you know i know i know <laughs> did we did we read about him in the second book or something yeah <laughs> yeah i'm just like man this you know I don't, I don't know if they were worried about having the same uh victim complex for chaos space marine players they're like they never mention us <laughs> they're like fine give them a shout out <laughs> oh, God. but uh yeah it definitely <laughs> felt that way and like as you know it, it was fine just like yeah, yeah. Sc- scrooge goes back and forth with knowing if the ghost of christmas past are real or not so it is horrible. um i and guess, I guess to, the, to the author's credit you know it's it's so brilliant that he or any of these authors can put words on a piece of paper and they can elicit this level of emotion from us oh yeah you know, I mean, it's it's just amazing. It's such a gift to me, um, you know, and then you get past it and it's like, yeah, I get it. I love the story still, but I, I just can never get over how how much um, how emotive the words can be. Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing I do want to say in, in the book's defense, even though it is my least favorite of the opening mm-hmm. ones, um, yeah. writing different things requires different skills from writers. So mm. anytime this story is like tangible of Erebus being manipulative and the dialogue of the characters, I think all of that was great. I think he struggled to really articulate the ethereal, like mm-hmm. to kind of put it um, as a counterpoint. If you want someone who's really good at that, John French is a fantastic author who wrote Armand series for 40 years. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And he does a great job of giving you very like psychedelic visuals of what the warp is like whereas this felt very like it, it just felt different i don't think it was his strong suit is what i'm saying but i think it's a well-written book up until then and then it yeah. just kind of like acid trips into we hate the emperor and it's like well i'm here for it i mean i'm already signed up i already got a 30k army well the thing is afterwards you feel like you've been on a really crazy roller coaster ride that's got like three or four loops in it you know and everything and you're just like yeah. I hope this this has to end sometime and then you get off and like five minutes later you're looking for the next ride yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. it was really disturbing but you're like okay i get it yeah. let's find another ride like that absolutely <laughs> yeah so so moving on a little bit um as all the things are happening down on the planet and in the lodge we've got a lot of stuff happening on the vengeful spirit there's a lot of things going on yes uh-huh. actually um one thing I just want to touch on, it's very okay. brief. Uh, the book does a great job, I feel like, of three perspectives. That's Horus, uh, Loken, who's trying to unwrap the mystery, mm-hmm. Horus's journey in the warp or whatever, and then the human elements who yes. are responding. That's what you're about to get into. And yes, like, and that's a great point. Yeah. Yes, the, those three perspectives as humanity, the 
the the ideal of a space marine, meaning Loken, who's meant to protect us, and then Horus's fall are all three mm, that's a great, viewpoints that we view between. That's a great point. Yep. And Graham does a great job of transitioning between those. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, because he, the next part of the book, he's talking about what's going on. And we hear all these familiar names. Uh, Cinderman, for example, yep. the iterator. Um, we can almost say uh, ex-priest of the Imperial Truth. Uh, he's been studying a lot on board the archives. And he discovers a really strong connection between the Serpent Temple and Chaos. Mm -hmm. No surprise to us, but now he sees it. He shares those findings with Loken, um, who comes to see him. Um, and, and so that you get that clarity now. We're starting to see all those connections. But Loken and those civilians you talk about are now making those connections. Carcassi, of course, being the guy who has no concept of the effect of what he does around him. Uh, he writes about the brutality you know, on the hangar deck and he starts distributing these writings all over the ship. And you're thinking like, don't you expect somebody to just beat the crap out of you? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, and then, so he's doing that. And then Afraidy is attacked by a bunch of people on, or I think it was soldiers on Davin um, who know she's distributing this Lecticio Divinitatis thing. And, yep. you know, she's taking that risk. And um, of course, Torgadon finds her, they go to Cinderman, you know, where Loken is, um, and all these things now um, cause him, you know, everybody now I think is starting to doubt when they say him. I, I say I think all, um, both uh, Loken and Torgadon, Cinderman, certainly Keeler are doubting the Imperial truth now. And he asked about the Lecticia. Here's a Marine and Cinderman asking about the Lecticio. You're going, boof, man, <laughs> that is really weird. And then we get this very, very significant scene where Cinderman and Keeler actually start to read the words in the Lecticio. And we're going to find out mm -hmm. why all this happened later. Um, so they accidentally summon a demon from the warp as they're reading these, these words and they have no concept of how to deal with this, of course. No. Um, so there's an astropath who comes to help because these astropaths have these uh, like these eyes that they're they're almost like this beam of warp energy that come out when they reveal them or something. Um, but before this astropath can help, Keeler literally channels the emperor's power and destroys the demon. And like everybody's just their mouths are just yeah. all open and of course you know being in the in the you know world christian view you know of a miracle the miracle spreads quickly as all miracles do in any religion and all of a sudden keeler is on her way to being a saint so yes it, yes it, <laughs> but it's that one scene and everything changes for her and her life she becomes a totally different character now in the books for a very long time at least yeah you know you've lived an interesting day when you wake up a photographer and go to sleep a saint of a new religion <laughs> <laughs> and she's busy. probably looking at her hands going what did i do yeah i, I don't day. even know what i did right? <laughs> so it's it's very cool but it was so cool it was such a very cool thing that happened um one thing okay, I do so want to point out, though, about that, as I was, I had to re-listen to it because I'm doing the audiobook version. Yeah, sure. And uh, so they're trying to understand this document that they found on the planet, and oh yeah, uh, you're afraid. He's like, I've seen that before. He's like, you haven't seen this? Like, no, I have. And she pulls up pictures of Erebus, and he has yes. those same symbols that summoned a demon on his face. <sighs> and it it took me out of the moment because one, I think that's really cool. But also, I'm like, all they did was read it, and they unleashed hell on themselves why why is nothing happening with this thing tattooed on this dude's face <laughs> like, yes how does erebus just not bring demons everywhere i don't know i just i was just a little bit taken yes. out by like what do you mean it's tattooed on his face <laughs> <laughs> yes the truth will be revealed yeah the truth will be revealed um so yeah there there we are you know horace is out he's healed things are quote back to normal you know and so at this point, it's apparent that Horus and the Lodge are beginning to work towards new goals. They're, you know, the and, and the Lodge is definitely uh, an arm of chaos in, aboard this ship and in this legion now. There's no question. It is, it is the key communications device um, 
And one of the things, too, though, is to understand that a lot of the Sons of Horus are not aware of what's going on still. They, they don't know the Marines. There are many Marines that don't understand what these goals are. They're not aware at all that chaos has infiltrated their legion. They just don't know. Yes. Um, and that's kind of sad in one way, but you can understand how it's working. And now that Horus is part of the club, man, it's just there's no limit. Um, so, so the next kind of significant thing is they encounter a, a civilization called the Aration Technocracy. And that would imply, of course, that they have a lot of old, uh, very old, valuable um, tech yep. that would be very valuable to the not only the Imperium, but the, the Mechanicum would be very interested in this stuff. Oh, and um, so they send an ambassadorial party to meet with Horus, and Horus slaughters them. It's like, okay, if there was any doubt where Horus was on the spectrum now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and of course, he just did that because he thought they were going to assassinate him. He, I, I, I'm so sorry. I thought you were going to assassinate him. So I just wiped yeah. out. MBD, yeah. Yeah, right? And so he declares war on their society. And the, here's here's the thing. We talked about a guy named Regulus as an important character at the end of the, the last episode. Mm-hmm. He's a emissary from the Mechanicum on Mars. And how he is starting to fit in here is that the reason, one of the main reasons Horus um, declared war on this society is because they have very valuable, something called STCs, which are standard template constructions. So they're ancient technology that can be vehicles or weapons or almost anything. Mm -hmm. And these templates are just like relics. They're like ancient invaluable relics to the Mechanicum. So he, Horus promises Regulus as the emissary that, you know what, we're going to hand these SDCs over to you um, in exchange for the Mechanicum supporting us in the coming war. Yep. Oh my gosh, man. <laughs> and, and that's massive for them because, I mean, they worship the technology of old mankind. Yes. So it, it would be like, I don't know, Jesus coming down with a third tablet of the commandments and being like, yo, dog, if you want these, just follow me. And it's like, of course, they're all going to say, what are you talking about? Yes. <laughs> of course. Yes. <yeah>, true. <laughs> so true. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a, an interesting connection, I think, that's valuable to talk about here. Uh, and then... Interestingly enough, we have two more legions that are joined uh, by Horus, and it's about a nine-month pacification yep. uh, of of this uh, technocracy. So you get the Emperor's children and the world that are now part of this happy, happy Horus family. Yes. So we're up to three. Well, if you count the word bearers, we're up to four uh, legions that have sided with Horus now, you could say. Yes, and uh, and if you want to be technical, we can even go as far as to say five, because at this point, unbeknownst to anyone who's never read past this, uh, Magnus has already tried to reach out to the Emperor, or is actively trying to, mm, and, mm-hmm. which sets off the set the series of events that lead to the burning yes. of Prospera. Yes, of course, of course, yeah. And uh, then we have Fabius Bile, who uh, is a very significant in the heresy and beyond a character who is the chief apothecary of the third legion, the emperor's children. Mm -hmm. And um, he is handed the anathema, uh, which he turns over to the emperor's children, Primarch Fulgrim. So Fulgrim is now in possession of the anathema. Yep. That's where it is. We're going to keep track of that little bad boy. Yeah. That, Um, that ends up being a narrative thread that brings us to Fulgrim at the end. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Uh, stuff. And then uh, during the fighting, uh, there's some fighting that goes on. Uh, the commander of the Imperial Army, uh, Hector Varvarus, is killed in the fighting. And Angron, who is the Primarch of the World Eaters, is almost killed. Angron's almost killed a lot in the heresy. <laughs> well, because he keeps running face <laughs> this first is in the, the battle. first of many almost kills. <laughs> Um, he brings a fist to a bolter fight, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, so Horus, you know, they're having a, a funeral for uh, Varvarus, and Horus starts uh, kind of, you know, saying all these wonderful worlds are about Varvarus and stuff, but his real betrayal begins by kind of eliminating his enemies, cleaning house, as it were. 
Mm-hmm. So the first significant assassination is Magard, who we will see again many times. Um, well, not many times, but we'll see him again in, in the next couple of books. Um, he was the bodyguard of this Petronella Vivar, who was the biographer for Horace. Yep. And he's now the chief enforcer of Malagurst, who is uh, Horace's uh, equerry. And Horace has basically ordered Magard to kill Carcasi, the poet. Um, and Horace murders the biographer himself because something we didn't mention was as he was dying or he thought he was dying, he kind of did the, you know, as a lot of people do, all kinds of deathbed confessions, you know. So she knew a lot about Horace and he was having none of that. So mm-hmm. she's gone. carcasey has gone. Uh, <laughs> man, it, it just slowly but surely. And now the Lodge, the Lodge, uh, calls Torgadon. And I guess they, don't you think, they still kind of trust him. They still kind of think he's part of the club, I guess. Yeah, I mean, because he was on there before Loken as well. So I'm I'm sure there's some camaraderie built in. Yeah, and they're sharing some stuff with him. They're first of all going to say that they understand Loken's a threat and they are going to execute him. They want Torgadon to know that. Um, They want to him to know that they they're going to silence or already have silenced Carcassi. And then um, when they tell Torgadon this, he basically is like he kind of gives them the middle finger and says, "You guys can pack sand." I yeah. Whatever you're going to do, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to find my friend Loken, and we are going to do whatever we can to stop you fools. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And we're introduced to a few uh, characters along that path, too, like people who yes. were there before Horus took over. The half herd is a name of yes. a soldier. That's his nickname because no one listens to him. He's an old man. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, and, you know, like we're going to know him a little bit more when future events happen. But yeah, uh, Torgadon is really standing up to, to Horus and being like, no, nope. no. Well, not to Horus himself specifically, but the, mm-hmm. the Lodge that he represents. Yep. And then Horus holds a super secret meeting of the Lodge Club. And uh, obviously the people there are the ones who support him. And they understand clearly that his intention is to overthrow the Emperor. And now he is going to share his plans for a little operation in a small system known as Istvan. Yes. So, which is a big red flag for anyone who understands what happens at Istvan, and I can't wait to get into it. <laughs> it's gonna be so good. It's gonna be so good, man. So, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Backing up after the whole story, uh, pass fail. What you, would you like? What you didn't you like? I, as as I said at the beginning, I'm troubled by how we got here a little bit, but I'm glad we're here, and I'm glad that now it's. It's not so much that we're kind of dancing around what we know was coming. We're there. Every you, It's very yeah. clear by the end of the book who is on whose side and, you know, where things are going. And yeah. from that perspective, I like the way that Graham has ended the book because of any questions we had or little maybe frustrations with the way the story progressed. The end result is that we can clearly move to the next step and understand um, what's going to happen and um, who's going to be doing what. Now, I think that's great to have that preparation for something that's as significant as what happens in Galaxy of Flame. Okay. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I uh, it, These are hard books to capture because so much happens between all the human elements, discovering God Emperor for the first, last time. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot. Um, overall, I thought it was a pretty good book. I, I didn't care so much for the, the spirit realm sequences, but um, like you said, yeah, it did. By the end of it, it definitely drew the line in the sand. We know kind of where everybody stands to an extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I like that. That's very nice, very clear. And I think I thought I had. Well, one of the things for me while you're you're digging on that, um, yeah, you know, I think I would still encourage uh, readers and listeners, however you absorb the material, to still read or listen to the books. Um, hopefully, this is giving you a really strong interest in the books. But there's a lot of little details that we obviously aren't covering in an hour, or hour and a half. Oh yeah, that that make the book and the story much, much more interesting. Um, so certainly encourage you to read, or you, you can just keep listening to us and we'll, we'll keep you in, informed of what's going on with the story. But um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, I don't know. I, I like it. It still leaves a lot of questions. You know, once you got past the, the scene inside Horace's brain, I feel like it, mm-hmm. it leveled out again really well. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that, 
I don't feel like was conveyed in the Black Library books, but I do feel like was conveyed in the Forge World ones, the old uh, oh, yeah. uh, campaign books they had for whatever. Sure. Uh, was this idea of like just how uh, deep Horace's planning went. Like this makes it seem oh. like I'm a bad guy now and now we're going to go to Istvan and start the heresy. But mm. like he was in the months that it took for this, what we don't know or what we learn later is that he's been devising all kinds of very complicated plans. Like he's sending <laughs> Reboot Gilliman to certain parts of the star system so that he will not be aware of what happens. He's deploying troops in weird ways. He's manipulating how ammunition is distributed. So loyalists or people that he thinks might end up being loyalists will not have reserves it's just like all of these background things Mm -hmm. like because at the end of this i was you know if you just had this information i'd be like well why is horace so valuable like he kind of seems like a hothead who got led by the nose down Mm -hmm. the path Mm -hmm. to hell in this book but when you put it in context of everything else it's he has a lot more nuance i guess and like the scope of the heresy is much bigger than what we see here yeah there was a a short story i think i mentioned before but it was about a planet that horus was going to conquer and he sent an emissary and he was having this conversation on on his ship before he invaded and just the way that the reader was conveying who Horace was. He was so composed. Yep. He was so, he knew exactly what was going to happen before it happened. He was looking at the holographs of the battle and he knew, he, he was just explaining what the enemy was going to do before they did it. Mm-hmm. And you're like, this guy is a freaking genius. He is, it, the, the emperor chose him to be war master for a reason. Yeah. And, this, when you see how devious and how much of a, a an amazing strategist Horus was, you understand. And to your point, you start seeing more and more of this as he comes out of the end of this book that he is just brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Yep, I would totally agree with that. I uh, had a listener question that I thought was interesting. Yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry, we'll close this out here. Anyway, friends, that is our coverage of False Gods, a very interesting look into the nature of mankind's worship, the birth of the Church of the Emperor, and uh, the fall of Horus as a, a villain. So uh, we're going to do this transition really quick over to listener questions. If you are listening to this and you would like to ask a question, go to my YouTube channel. It's in the description down below um two plus stuff you'll see the emperor protects episodes there leave them in the comments uh and i will pull them up for the next episode um this one comes from amusing parks and i like this so it says content request i thought every legion went part and parcel to loyalist or heretic sides and only recently learned that there were individuals who deviated from the direction of their legion Mm. this fascinates me and i'd love to learn more about the non-conformists so Oh yeah. Um, there are some exceptionally notable nonconformists, shall we say? One of them is <laughs> your favorite character, right, Garo? Yes, Nathaniel Garo, the Death Guard. Yeah. Yes, the loyalist Death Guard. <laughs> um, but yes, amusing parks to your answer. Uh, to answer your question, Forge World went through great pains to show just how complicated and confusing a civil war on this scale would be. Um, in the third book, uh, was it Horus Heresy Three Extermination? The heresy has already begun. The Alpha Legion are besieging a planet, and then an Iron uh, Warrior ship shows up, and you'd think that they'd be friends because they're both chaos. But the Iron Warrior ship was in space and deep space, or in the warp whenever all this went down, so they have no clue. So it's just this weird. Mm -hmm. the legion that fell to chaos has guys here that are technically loyalists fighting against the traitors who are fighting against the neutral part it's just this it's (laughs) havoc it's you know what i mean perspectives are so blended (laughs) yeah and we're going to talk about um in a couple more books we're actually going to talk about the survivors of certain things and to the the listener's question they actually have a specific name and, and a specific role in the story going mm-hmm. forward um, they kind of coalesce around a couple of leaders and so there are loyalists out there even though their legions have been uh yeah so yep, absolutely and um a lot of it it's not so much that it's a uh... A, dis, a lock and key thing on legion to legion like all death card went this way all death card went that right. way but rather it seems to be a lot more focused in my opinion on 
Terranborn versus those that they picked up mm-hmm. from the Primarch's planet. Yep. And that is its own can of worms. <laughs> yep. Because um, the people that they picked up, you know, obviously have a lot of skill and strength and stuff like that. They are Astartes, but they have different values. Yes. Reasoning and all this kind of stuff. So it gets real murky real fast. Yes. Agreed. That is true. Absolutely. And that was it. That was the only, only question okay. this week. So go ahead and right. ask some more folks. Uh, okay. Dan, do you have anything else you want to add? No, I think that's it, my friend. I think we're okay. we're ready to roll for the next book. And um, yeah, good another good read. So Absolutely. Here, and then the next book is going to be Galaxy in Flames. Is that right? Yep, Galaxy in Flames. Awesome. Uh, by Ben Counter, who I really do enjoy his oh, writing. We love him. We love so, him. Uh, we'll join us in about two weeks. We'll be talking all about that, and we'll see the true tragedy that is the Horus Heresy's beginning, opening act, I should say. Uh, Dan, I want to thank you so much for all your note taking. No problem, buddy. No yeah, problem. Yeah. And for everybody else, uh, we will catch you next time. And uh, again, have your questions for um, the next book in the comments, and we'll talk with you then. 